Okay, welcome to you all to this for the second Pocelli lecture. Professor Ken Anno from Emory University on cool theorems proved by undergraduates. Hi everybody. Yeah. Great, so I'd like to get started by saying that um, what do I want to say? This this lecture actually is somewhat of um, uh, a snapshot of things that we do every summer at Emory. At Emory, we run what's called a, an REU. I know there's, I think there's, am I correct? There's, you run an REU in the math department here. Now, so just like the REUs you run here at LSU, I've been participating in REUs at Emory and before that at the University of Wisconsin, and it's super fun. One of the reasons that we like to run REUs is that it's an opportunity to, well, teach something very exciting that falls beyond the scope of ordinary classroom lecture and exam. By the way, that's super important because at the end of the day, if you become a professor or if you become a mathematical scientist in industry, you'll discover they don't give you tests. You aren't graded. You're actually evaluated for the quality of the work that you produce which usually doesn't come with a timeline, and usually involves skills that you don't actually hone in ordinary courses. For example, how do you, how do you assemble a strategy for producing um, a device or solve a problem or coming up with a model? Right? These are things that don't necessarily have a right or a wrong answer, but require practice before you get good at it. So one of the reasons that we run in these REUs is that well, for students, students will engage in original research, sometimes resulting in publications. But what's really important is learning how to be brave enough to ask a question. Maybe ask a question that hasn't yet been answered and understand that maybe a lot of the time you're completely confused or literally stuck. But then, if all goes well, there will be an aha moment where, oh my god, I actually proved a theorem or I discovered something that I can call my own. And I don't know, when I was in college, that never happened. And uh, but by the time you're in graduate school, it starts to happen. And the great things about REUs is that you can experience that while you're still in college. And of course, while you're in an REU, if you take an REU, participate in one, you end up learning a whole lot more about yourself than you probably ever thought you would. It's not about necessarily writing papers. It's really learning a lot about what floats your boat. Great. So let me tell you about some of the things that we've done. So I apologize for this being a little bit cheesy. I thought this would be like a pizza lecture to maybe 10 or 15 students. So for the professors, uh, just what can I say? I'm just going to be myself. So thanks to the National Science Foundation, um, I've had the opportunity, just like your faculty here at LSU, they pay us to play. Actually, that's a small secret. They pay us to play. And it actually literally is true. I do shoot off fireworks. If you ever meet students who've been to my REU, you'll know that you may learn that I'm a little bit over the top with fireworks. I'm really proud of fireworks that are like this tall, that shoot off into the sky and do crazy stuff. In fact, I even write that into my NSF grants. And not once has anyone ever commented on the suitability of them. In any event, so I like to shoot off fireworks every 4th of July, and I have gotten into trouble with the police. I used to live in a place called Johns Creek, Georgia, where, yeah, I don't live there anymore. It was a little bit too conservative for me, and the neighbors just didn't like my fireworks. Uh, but of course, NSF is supporting us in terms of our educational outreach activities. And some of the things that we've done is we aim to prove theorems in number theory. I spend uh, a little bit of my time, literally actually every day, collecting problems that I think are accessible. I'm not going to call them low-lying fruit because I think as the, as the talk proceeds, you'll discover that it, these really aren't low-lying fruit problems. But I spend a lot of time uh, collecting problems that I think have a number of properties. One, they're exciting. Two, they're accessible. Three, students will end up learning a lot during the course of the program, and four, to have the prospect to be successful. In our program, we've been very fortunate, um, and uh, let me let the theorems kind of speak for themselves. 
great. So I've broken up this talk into just three topics. I've been doing this for a number of years, so they're, they're, we, we've worked on topics certainly that have gone beyond the things I'm going to talk about today. But for the purposes of um, this lecture, I want to stick to just three topics. One, problems on primes. The prime numbers always seem to be in the news. That's not quite true. If you turn on the news, it's always about politics in the White House. But for math doesn't often make the news, but often when it does make the news, it's about primes. Okay. And I want to talk about partitions. Sometimes that makes the news, not very often. And lastly, I want to talk about some objects called number fields. Great. So there are three parts to this talk. And so I'd like to begin by telling you about some famous theorems about primes. I'm going to lead you into some questions, which I think you will agree are interesting questions. And then I hope you believe me when I tell you about some theorems that college students proved. Great. So here is a theorem due to Euclid. And the theorem says that there are infinitely many prime numbers. And my guess is that nobody in this audience is surprised to learn that there are infinitely many prime numbers. In fact, my guess is that many of you probably even more or less know the proof that there are infinitely many prime numbers. If you don't, let me just talk through it. As we know, by the fundamental theorem of, of arithmetic, integers factor into primes uniquely. So it's not true to say that there's infinitely many primes because there are infinitely many numbers, but it's almost true. Right? If you write down the powers of two, there's infinitely many of them, but you don't need to know any more than, you only need to know one prime to write down the infinitely many powers of two. So how could you prove there are infinitely many prime numbers by just slightly extending that wrong sentence? Well, it's the following. Suppose there are only finitely many prime numbers, p1, p2, p3, through pt. Multiply them all together, and you get a larger number. If you add one to that number, you get an even larger number, but you get a special number. You get a number which isn't divisible by any of the primes you started with, p1 through pt, because of course, if you divide that number by any of those, you get a remainder of one. And whenever you get a remainder, you haven't divided. Something's left over. Therefore, if there are only finitely many primes, you will have produced numbers that have no prime factors, and we know that's not legal. So that's more or less Euclid's argument, and I hate it. I like that I can describe it to you, but I hate it because often when we teach this kind of theorem in an introductory number theory class, you no longer believe there's anything hard about the primes. That's so false. So first of all, if you try to take Euclid's argument and produce prime numbers, you can't do it. Right? If you took the first 50 primes, multiplied them together, and add one, you produce a gigantic number. It'll have a prime factor you didn't know before, but it's certainly not going to be like the 51st prime. It's going to be some much, much larger prime. And so if you try to use this argument to count how many primes there are, even say up to a million, you'll do a very, very bad job. So one of the things I do in my Foundations of Mathematics class is talk about theorems like this. And we start by criticizing proofs. Of course, you have to first learn when a proof is correct. That's a skill. Because the first thing is, if you write down proofs that are incorrect, you need to know how to detect when your proof is wrong. But the next skill, which we don't do a good job of teaching, is criticizing proofs that are correct. How can a correct proof be criticized? can be criticized if it doesn't answer all the questions that you want to answer. And that's a skill that we develop in REUs. And all of your professors will tell you that, they've, that one of their best skills, one of the best skills that they have to perfect throughout their careers is asking, learning how to ask a good question. Because sometimes asking a good question opens doors and even reveals difficult problems for which everyone in the universe, or their mathematical universe, already had the tools to answer. And it's shocking how often that happens. I'd say that the vast majority of papers that are published, even in the top journals, were, could have been solved by almost everybody in the field, apart from two or three little lemmas. If you write a 30-page paper, maybe you're only proud of two pages. But without those two pages, you have no result. So these are the sorts of things that you learn about in an REU. And I just took a moment to criticize Euclid. He's famous, he can take it, and, and he's not even alive, and right. 
better to be criticized, right? Great. So there's a better theorem. There's a better theorem that exists thanks to the existence of a field called complex analysis. And it's called the prime number theorem. And it's about this function pi of x. If you want to count the number of primes up to a large number x, then it's been proven that pi of x is very much like this unattractive function, x divided by the natural log of x. Let's take a moment to think about that. Why is this theorem a beautiful theorem? It's actually very easy to remember why this theorem is a good theorem. Suppose x is a gigantic number, like e raised to the 100 power. That's e times e to the right. What is the natural log of e to the 100? Well, I picked it very nicely. The natural log of e to the 100 is 100. So if x is like e to the 100, pi of e to the, e to the 100 is e to the 100 divided by 100 which would be like 1% of the numbers up to e to the 100. So the great thing about the prime number theorem is if you were to approximate the number of primes up to some large number x, it's easy to see that the proportion of primes quickly decays. Up to e to the 100, you expect about 1% of the numbers to be prime, and that's rare. However, up to e to the 10th, which is, by the way, still a very large number, what percent would we get? We would get the natural log of e to the 10th is 10, and you divide by 10, that's 10%. If 10% of the numbers were prime, you wouldn't be impressed with Euclid. But up to e to the 100, only 1% are prime. Up to e to the 1,000, only 1 tenth of 1% are prime. So despite the fact there are infinitely many primes, they become vanishingly rare. Not so vanishingly rare that there aren't infinitely many, but they've become vanishingly rare in the sense that they cut out a measure zero subset of the, of the primes. That's why I like the prime number theorem, and Euclid's theorem doesn't tell you that. Great. So here's another theorem. I like it. It's, it's very much a prime number theorem, and it's due to Dirichlet. And it says, suppose that 0 less than or equal to r less than t are integers that are relatively prime. They don't have a common factor. Instead of counting the primes up to x, let's count the special ones. And the special ones could be the primes up to x that are r mod t. What is a prime number theorem saying in this form? It says that there's a function called Euler's phi function that weights this function. It tells you how many primes there are up to x that are congruent to r mod t. And what this 1 over phi of t is telling you is that there are phi of t many choices of r satisfying this condition. And the conclusion is that primes are randomly distributed or equally distributed among arithmetic progressions. So for example, if you let t be 3, 4, or 6, in each of these cases, there are only two remainders that you can write down that are relatively prime to these values. And because there are only two choices, half the primes are the form 3n plus 1 and the other half of the form 3n plus 2 and likewise for these arithmetic progressions. And you can count. If you wrote a computer program and you wrote out the primes, after dividing by 6, after skipping 2 and 3, half the primes would be of this form, and the other half would be of that form. And as 6 became more complicated, these lists would, in principle, grow. But among each of those options, the primes would be randomly distributed. I like that. And Euclid's theorem doesn't tell you that either. In fact, it's a standard exercise to show that Euclid's proof cannot generalize to this setting. Occasionally it does, but only for finitely many cases does that work. Great. So what about arithmetic progressions of primes? This is a very different problem. Dirichlet's theorem asked when primes lie within an arithmetic progression. We've answered that. You could ask the question, when do the primes form an arithmetic progression. That's very difficult. What does it mean to say you form an arithmetic progression? You start with the number a, you add b. You add b again to get a plus 2b. Add b again, get a plus 3b, and that would be an arithmetic progression. How, how long can an arithmetic progression of primes get, where every term has to be prime? Well, here is a theorem from 1939. For most of you, that's a long time ago. But in mathematics, theorems from 1939 can occasionally still be the state of the art. 
So it's a theorem of van der Korpen in 1939 that there are infinitely many length three arithmetic progressions of primes. So let me again emphasize what that means. If you start with three and add two, you get five. And if you add two again, you get seven. Here is an arithmetic progression of length three, and they're all prime, three, five, and seven. Starting at five, add 42. I'm not going to tell you where 42 came from. Actually, if you know 42, remember it's from whatever, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So 5 plus 42 and plus 42 again gives you these three numbers, and you can check. They are all prime. How about starting at 43? Well, if you add 30 and 30 again, you get these three numbers, and they are prime. And what van der Korpet's theorem says is that there's infinitely many configurations of three-term arithmetic progressions of primes. He didn't prove this by finding a formula for these triples. That would be like the ultimate theorem. He had to invent some devices for detecting these primes without being burdened with the responsibility of detecting them on the nose. That's the kind of thing that people do in astronomy. You're trying to seek evidence for things way out in the universe. We don't have the right to go out in the universe. So you get these radio telescopes and you, you measure the interference of stuff that that, that, that messes with the, the light or radio waves before they get to us, and you try to infer the existence of properties. And that's actually this, the kind of an exaggeration of what you actually do, but that's a, that's a way of kind of getting a feel for what mathematicians are trying to do when they prove these theorems. So if we were to critique this theorem, there's one obvious critique that we can impose, and what would that be? Well, if I ask you to prove that there's infinitely many pairs of primes that for form a two-term arithmetic progression, you would not be impressed because any pair of primes forms a two-term arithmetic progression. A to B, add some number, you got it, right? That's, that's like a nothing theorem. So to say that there are infinitely many primes forming a three-term arithmetic progression is one step beyond saying absolutely nothing. So I just trumpeted a, th trumpeted a theorem that is one step beyond doing absolutely nothing. So let's critique it. What would we want to do next? How about prove that there are arithmetic progressions of length? Four. Four. Good. All right. How long can they get? So I'm glad you said four. You might have been impressed if we said four. But there are people named Ben Green and Terry Tao who skipped the four. By the way, they skipped the five. By the way, they skipped the million. Instead of proving their arithmetic progressions of length four, they said pick any positive integer k. And there will be infinitely many length k arithmetic progressions. And that is doing mathematics. That is not an example of generalizing. That is an example of recognizing and seeing deficiencies in an earlier argument and recognize that there's a, gem, there's a germ of a good idea, but it hasn't been implemented well. What is the measure theory that you have to implement to go to infinity? Let's see if we can do that in this bypass 4, 5, 6. You want to win a Fields Medal? You do something like that. Terry Tao uh, won the Fields Medal largely for this theorem and a number of other theorems that are equally shocking. Are you shocked? You said four. If I had done 20, you might have been impressed. All right, go to infinity. You win the Fields Medal. Great. So for example, if you start at 199 and add whatever it is, a bunch of times, here you get a length 10 set a uh, length 10 arithmetic progression of primes. By the way, the longer k gets, of course, the further apart they have to go. Otherwise, you begin to find absolutely elementary congruences. Great. All right. So what did I ask my REU students to do? So shortly after Green and Tao proved this theorem and Terry won the Fields Medal, I recognized that there was a, there was a target of opportunity among problems like this which actually, in my opinion, should have been a theorem that was proven before any of these theorems. So here's a question that's, that is related, and it says this. Can you find k consecutive primes that end in the digit 1? So I don't mean consecutive numbers that end in the digit 1 that are all prime. That would be forming an arithmetic progression. But let's weaken that. What if we write out the primes in order? two, three, five, seven, and just ask, if we were to walk along the primes, how often would we get five primes in a row that end in one without primes intervening, intervening to end in three or seven? So let's think about that for a moment. Can a prime end in five if it's larger than five? 
No. Can a prime end in an even number if it's not two? So what are the only options for the last digit of a prime number once it's bigger than five? It can only be one, three, seven, or nine. Do you agree? So it'd be like asking, among these four options, imagine you have a tetrahedral die, a pyramid, numbered one, three, seven, and nine. Could we roll that die over and over again 50, and get 53s in a row? Well, you know, in principle, that's allowed to happen. But what if I told you none of us are allowed to leave the room until we've rolled 53s in a row? You'd be like, holy crap, what did I sign up for? This, this lecture sucks. But that's the kind of thing I'm asking. If we walk along the primes, can I get a thousand primes in a row that end in one without any sneaking in that end in three, seven, or nine? You may know the story, right? If you put enough monkeys in a room, one of them will eventually type right, a Shakespeare play. It's something like that. So for example, here are some consecutive primes. Between 181 and 191, there are no primes. So here are two that end in one. Between 4,831 and 4,871, there's only one prime, and it happens to end in the digit one. So here are three consecutive primes that end in one. So here's a great theorem. It should be much more famous than it is. It's by Dan Shu, proven in 2000. After this, he ended up writing jokes, became a professional joke writer, writing jokes for Jay Leno. Uh, but this theorem is no joke, and his theorem says this. Let's let P1 be 2 for the smallest prime. Let P2 be 3 for the next prime. Let's let the Pn be the primes in order, where Pn is the nth prime. If R and T are any integers that are relatively prime, then for every positive integer k, you can find k plus 1 consecutive primes that are all R mod T. So for example, if T is 10 and R is 1, there will be infinitely many consecutive primes that end in one of length k plus one. This is the theorem that says, given any book in the universe, a room of monkeys will eventually type exactly the text of that book. Now let's criticize this theorem. It, believe it or not, you can criticize this theorem. What could make this theorem even more awesome? Well, it's related to what I said before. It would really suck if I said none of us could leave the room until we right, rolled 53s in a row. This theorem comes with a bonus. I'm not going to give you the formula, but it will tell you by when, in the sequence of primes, you've encountered the first k plus 1, all r mod t, without a single one screwing it up. So the primes aren't random. Although Dirichlet's theorem gives you this, this false assumption that the primes are random, arithmetically, statistically, it seems to be random but they aren't random because we can guarantee by when such phenomena exists. So how to put it another way, if I gave you a coin and I said, I have the ability, I have the magical power to predict by when at least one of us will flip 50 heads in a row and I have a proof for that, that's kind of what this theorem comes with. It's crazy. It's a beautiful theorem. So this is what I asked my REU students to do. This theorem should have been famous. In fact, um, I, I think I said that before. I think you now understand the impact of this. I think this theorem, can, well, uh, well, I already said that. Um, so let me tell you about a theorem that some of my undergraduate students proved, uh, extending it. So the definition is actually quite technical, so I won't offer it. But what I wanted to say, in mathematics, one of the things that you often do is, after you study a, a research paper, you ask, is this research paper a glimpse of something much larger? So one of the skills that we, we try to perfect in, in mathematics, or as professionals, or as graduate students, is to try to analyze the stuff that we read and seek bigger theorems. Are we just studying a special case of a much bigger phenomenon? So that's what I asked my students to do, uh, Maria, Sarah, and Linnell. Actually, Maria and Sarah both won the Schaefer Prize. Uh, and their theorem is for very special sets of primes, and they defined what that meant. It's a technical definition, so I won't offer it here. For very special sets of primes, there are indeed arbitrarily long sequences of primes in any fixed arithmetic progression. They prove Shue's theorem by relaxing what's required for a subset of primes. 
And then they went on to prove that lots of natural sets of numbers satisfy these conditions. So let me give you an example. Let's define the sequence n sub pi to be the integer parts of the multiples of pi. So the integer part of pi is 3. There's a prime. What's the integer part of 2 pi? 6, not prime. What's the integer part of 3 pi? 9, not prime. The very next prime you get, you have to be very patient and wait until 31. 3.1, right? Until 31. The very next prime in this sequence isn't until 31. So many of you might actually be wondering, holy crap, are there actually infinitely many primes in this sequence? Three, skip a bunch, get to 31. When do you get the next one? My students prove that. My students prove that there are infinitely many primes in this sequence. But they did better than that. They proved that for every arithmetic progression, there are arbitrarily long subsequences of that exotic set of primes, all in a fixed arithmetic progression. So they were able to prove that there are infinitely many primes in the sequence. Starts with 3, 31, next one's 37. It skips a bunch. But even though it skips a bunch and misses a large proportion of the numbers that are prime, it's still true that, that you can find arbitrarily long sequences of them in any arithmetic progression. Isn't that cool? All right. So let me give you some examples. The first six primes in that sequence that are all 5 mod 7 is here. Trust me, they're all prime, and, they're all inter and they are indeed all integer parts of multiples of pi. And their theorem is sharp, because it, I think if you change this 2 to a 3, that's where their bound was when you found the first consecutive six primes in the sequence. So I really like that. If you're wondering what other special sets of primes could include, if alpha is any real algebraic, irrational real algebraic integer like the square root of 2, and you consider the integer parts of their multiples, the same theorem is true. This is a little bit weird to look at, but if you consider the integer multiples of n times log log n, the point is log log n grows to infinity, so this is actually a density zero subset of the primes. It is still true. So, um, yeah, so they prove that kind of theorem. Isn't that neat? Good. I like that. If you didn't know that the integer multiples of pi, the greatest integer, the, the, the integer function of multiples of pi contains infinitely many primes, well, come to our program, and that's the kind of thing that you could prove if you start working on primes. And if time permits, then we try to do something awesome like that. So, like I said, we play with numbers, and most of my projects have various levels. There's levels that I'm absolutely confident the students can solve, and if time permits, we try to get to the next level. And this is an example where we actually got to the very maximal level that I ever possibly imagined we could do. OK. Now here's a second topic. I'm going to start with a question. Try to find for me a closed formula for the infinite product 1 minus q to the 18th times 1 minus q squared to the 18th going off to infinity. First of all, it's a bit weird of a question because I'm asking you to write down a power series that's exhibited as an infinite product, but it makes sense. And if you combine like terms, the first few terms of this series looks like this. And I'm asking you, find for me a closed formula for this infinite product, one that says for free that, there, that the coefficient of q to the fifth after you combine like terms should be 1,242. You're like, that's weird. If that weren't weird, it would be like saying you see a clear pattern, a clear formula for these coefficients in order. And I wrote down these coefficients in order, the first few, because I want you to stare at them and say, God, what kind of formula would give this particular sequence in order? Even, the, even the, the, the pattern of the signs is very chaotic. So if you figure it out, tell me. Yeah, I don't have a good answer for that. Actually, I do have an answer for that. But if you find a formula that turns out to be different from what I'm about to say, I really want to see it because it, uh, it might help you win a Fields Medal. So a moment ago, I talked about this theorem of Terry Tao that helped him win a Fields Medal. And I'm going to tell you now, in a moment, another theorem that helped win someone a Fields Medal that's directly related to something this elementary. These are very recent Fields Medals. So, so to back up a little bit, there are some beautiful identities that you can write down that resemble 
the kind of question I asked, but you can all guess what the answer is when I show the first few terms, unlike this last example. So Euler proved that if you look at this strange product q times infinite product n equals 1 to infinity of 1 minus q to the 24n, multiply out all of those terms, when you combine like terms, instead of getting crazy coefficients like 1,242, you get a series that begins with this. And it's probably surprising, if I ask you to multiply 50,000 polynomials together and combine like terms, you're probably going to expect, holy crap, I'm going to get awful numbers like 8,000 something occasionally. But what's true about the coefficients here? Do you see any coefficients that are anything other than 0 or plus or minus 1? No. And it's not because your eyes are deceiving you. If you could look off to infinity and go off to infinity, you will never find any coefficients other than 0 or plus or minus 1. Despite the fact you are right in thinking I'm multiplying out infinitely many polynomials and I'm adding and combining like terms. It's crazy magical cancellation makes that happen. But it's even better. What is the pattern to the exponents? What can you tell me about the numbers 1, 25, 49, 121, so on and so forth? They are all perfect squares. They're not all the perfect squares, but if you play around with this, you'll see that these are the squares of numbers that don't have 2 or 3 as a factor, and the signs do literally alternate. And that does go on forever, and that's what Euler proved. Jacobi proved something similar. Here's an infinite product, and instead of just multiplying out first powers, if we cube, you get something like this. This is much easier to see. Let's read the coefficients in order. 1, minus 3, 5, minus 7, 9, 11. What are these coefficients in order? If you forget the sign. They are just the odd numbers in order. Now I know you know how to write down the odd numbers in order without multiplying out an infinite product, right? That's not how I'm trying to impress you. What I'm trying to impress you by is here's this crazy infinite product that auto-corrects. It auto-corrects in the sense that it knows that it only needs to know the odd numbers in order and the exponents are their squares. It auto-corrects. And there's a similar one proved by Gauss, which I talked about, I guess, in the class this morning, where if you multiply this out, believe it or not, you never get any coefficients other than 0 and 1. Try it. You'll, you'll get some crazy cancellation, and it almost always cancels to 0. And what are the exponents? The odd number squared in order. All right. So these identities are very rare. And as you can imagine, they should depend on accidents. And accidents are rare. But if accidents are rare, does that mean that there's no theory? Or does it mean we haven't seen enough of the glimpses of this theory to know what we're actually looking at? And believe it or not, what I'm about to describe to you, people were very stunned by a few years ago, including the experts who missed this completely. This is an example of a theorem that could have been proved in the 19th century. People knew it was an important theorem, and they totally missed the boat. So just a couple words. These identities can be proved by crazy combinatorial manipulation. I will spare you that. Sometimes they can be solved by using complex analysis, the theory of theta functions. I will spare you of that. And I'll certainly spare you from the theory of modular forms where a lot of these functions live. Because uh, my friend Andrei Okunkov and physicist uh, Andrei Nekrasov proved an amazing theorem that avoided all of that. So instead of finding rare identities, let's find the master formula that computes the coefficients of all of these once and for all. It exists. It exists. So there's a deeper structure to this identity, these identities, and they're so deep that you never ever have to multiply out and combine like terms to actually multiply. I love it. Whenever you have a theory that allows you to calculate infinitely many products without ever multiplying anything, you've probably done something. Great. So it turns out this is one of my favorite subjects. So let me slow down a little bit and explain uh, one way of thinking about this problem. So a non-increasing sequence of positive integers at sum to n is called a partition of n. And p of n is their count. So for example, 
The partitions of four are this set. We're breaking up four as a sum, including four itself. And there are no other ways of doing it. One, two, three, four, five. And if you count, you find that P of four is five. And it's not difficult to find a generating function for P of n. It just comes from formal manipulation of the geometric series. Not hard to show a summation P of n Q to the n is this infinite product. Just a hint of the proof. If there was no product here, if this was just 1 divided by 1 minus Q to the n, you could formally consider that as a geometric series in Q to the n. And if you multiply out infinitely many geometric series and think about it, you'll discover, well, I'm just formally reconstructing all the partitions of n. So here's the wishful thinking. Maybe it's true that there's a deeper combinatorial theory of infinite products, not those special identities. Maybe there's literally a deeper theory which offers that little lemma and that little trick from the geometric series as a glimpse of something much bigger. Maybe there is a theory that says the coefficient of q to the n is always for every one of these products, a different kind of formula involving the partitions. Instead of just counting them, maybe there's, a, there's an exotic set of ways of counting them that are in correspondence with the ways that you might choose to write down an infinite product. And that's true. So, and it turns out the device, people have been studying this device for well over 100 years. People in representation theory, people who studied the representation theory, the symmetric group have been studying the objects I'm about to tell you, and none of them knew the theorem I'm about to tell you. It's crazy. This ha so, every one of these partitions can be represented by what's called a Ferrer's board. I'll give an example in the next slide. In fact, maybe I should just skip the slide. Uh, but just in a word, in every one of these, these diagrams, you can construct an inverted L of, of cells and actually count how many cells make up that diagram. And the number of numbers, these numbers called the hook lengths, will form a set, a multi-set. There could be some repeats. And it turns out that the set of these hook lengths is actually vital for this problem of learning how to multiply. I want to emphasize, the only thing I'm asking you to do is learn how to multiply but by first forgetting that you know how to multiply. That's really what I'm asking you to do. So here's a partition, 5 plus 3 plus 2. It's 10. But the diagram I want to make that represents 10 is this. 5 corresponds to these 5 squares, 3 corresponds to these 3 squares, and 2 corresponds to these 2 squares, and you, you now see how I correspond one of these images to every partition of every integer. That one example is enough. But I've decorated these diagrams with some numbers. So let me indicate to you how these numbers are calculated. How do you get this number 7? Well, you can consider the inverted L that has at this corner the number 7. So if you count the number of squares, you get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So there's 7 squares that make that inverted L with that corner. How do you get this 4? There are these 4 squares. What about these 1s? These are the, these are the like, unfortunate ones that have no arms and legs. Maybe I shouldn't have said it that way, but I think you see what I mean. Okay. So like this 2 has, has this hook. There's nothing below it, so it's just the number 2. And then I think you can see how you can assemble all of these numbers. Believe it or not, this data is, is all that you need to write down some products. What is the set of hook lengths? They are just the numbers that make up this diagram for that partition lambda. And as you can see, there's some repeats. There are three ones. There are two twos. Okay. But you never get a number bigger than the partition that you are starting with. Great. So what did Okunkov and Nekrasov say? So I'm not going to tell you what they proved. What they just yet, of course I'm going to tell you what they proved. That would be a jerk if I didn't tell you what they proved after all that. I'm going to tell you that they discovered a, a crazy formula for this seemingly strange object. So let's first talk about what this object is. So let z be any complex number. For our purposes, pretend it's an integer, like 5 or 17. But it could be like i. But for the purposes of our talk, let's forget that. And what do I want to do? I want to build a power series in the variable q by summing over all the partitions of all integers. What is the absolute value of lambda? That's the size of your partition. So 5 plus 3 plus 2, in that case, would be 10. And what am I going to do for that partition? I'm going to weight it. Instead of weighting it by the number 1, which 
is what we did for p of n, counting each partition once. I'm going to count it in a funny way. I'm going to take the product over all the numbers that are the hook lengths of this expression, 1 minus z divided by h squared, where z is that parameter. And then I'm going to add up. I'm not multiplying out. I'm just adding up for every partition this thing. So let me tell you what this means. So returning to our example 5, 3, and 2, that means that that partition contributes to this sum, q to the 10th, 5 plus 3 plus 2 is 10, this product, and that product worked out over all of these terms is this polynomial in z. And what their function is saying is now just add these gadgets up over every partition. Good. Great. So let's revisit a famous identity using that formula. So let's consider the special case where z is 4. So going back, I'm just letting this number be the number 4. So the power series where z is 4. So there's the 4. Stupid question. For what value of h is this factor 0? 1 minus 4 over h squared. What value of h makes that 0? Well, 1 minus 1 is 0, so 4 over h squared better be 1. h is a hook length, so it's never, neg never negative. So what must be the value of h if any one of these factors is 0? 2. So I could just ask you, out of all the partitions of all integers, is there a special rule to the shapes that actually have a number 2 among the hook lengths? Or, stated another way, if I were to find all the partitions that don't have any 2's among the hook lengths, maybe I'm going to be cutting down dramatically on this sum. What do I get? Let's do an example. So to build this, we only need to know the partitions that don't have any hooks of 2. I didn't give you one yet, right? We had, in our example, we had two twos. But I could ask in an undergraduate class, find me all the partitions that have no numbers that are hook length 2. And take my word for it, within 15 minutes, you would have worked out a number of examples and you'd figure out the rule. But I don't have 15 minutes, so let me tell you what you discover. You discover that the only partitions that don't have a hook length of 2 are the ones that correspond to adding consecutive integers. 1, 1 plus 2, 1 plus 3, 1 plus, oh, did I say 1 plus 3? What a moron. 1 plus 2 plus 3, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. Those are the only partitions, and it would be an easy exercise for you to show that any other partition had to have a hook number of 2, so it wouldn't even contribute. So let's actually work that out. Here are the first few partitions that are sums of the consecutive integers starting at 1. Let's add them up, but then let's do a strange thing. Let's multiply by 8 and add 1. If you do that, you get the numbers 1, 9, 25, and 49 in order. What is that? What are the hook sets? Well, I'll leave it as an exercise that there are beautiful odd numbers that have a pattern. Because you will have had to figure that out to um, arrive at the conclusion that only the triangular numbers, the sums of consecutive integers starting at 1, are relevant. But notice, for these partitions, if you work out that crazy expression, you get plus or minus the odds in order, and that is an elementary exercise. I could walk you through that, but I didn't want to take the 15 minutes to do it. So what do we just prove? If you take my word for it, letting z equals 4 in that series gives the first few terms like this, and it goes on forever. But I showed you this series before. So I could ask, is this really that Jacobi identity, this infinite product raised to the third power that we computed without ever multiplying out a thing? And it's true. But I wrote it in a way, so I said, let z be 4. Now you've got to be wondering, what in the world am I allowed to let z be? But I told you, I said z could be any complex number, not one of those special numbers. z could be any complex number in the universe. And what is their theorem? This crazy thing, no matter how you choose z, is just raising the infinite product 1 minus q to the n to the z minus first power, independent of what z is. When z is 4, 4 minus 1 is 3, and I could compute that without ever multiplying a thing. So when I started this lecture, multiplying out that 18th power, I said, give me a formula if you see it. What I was trying to lead you up to is, by the way, if we let z be 19, 
19 minus 1 is 18, and that would be the formula for those crazy coefficients that you probably couldn't have seen before. But now if you start playing around with them, you can begin to see. I like that. Nekrasov and Akunkov have told us how to multiply out without ever multiplying a thing. Great. All right. So of course, if you let z be 0, this is then 1 minus q to the n to the negative 1 power. If z is 0, what are all of these products? 1 minus 0 is 1. So what are we counting? The partitions, but you see that. Sum over all the partitions, you count each of them once. It's a generating function for p of n. And this is actually how they thought. Maybe there's a way of taking that geometric series and produce something out of it. It's pretty, it's pretty ingenious. It's pretty ingenious to come up with that, because I don't see how you start with the geometric series and arrive at that. That helps you win a Fields Medal. Now, by the way, if you ever meet uh, Andre, he thinks this was super simple. Uh, I don't. I think it's incredible. Um, but what that really is an indication of is how deep the rest of his work was, at, which is at the interface of algebraic combinatorics, mathematical physics, and representation theory is. He views this as a little exercise. So a French mathematician by the name of Han, who is very Chinese, it's actually very interesting. I'm not accustomed to meeting Chinese people with a French accent, but I assure you Han is one. Very weird, really. I don't know why I said that, but I guess if I go to Japan, people might think it's very strange that I don't have a Japanese accent, so it's maybe something like that. Han generalized this in many ways, and one of the things he did is said that if I build this series, now with all of these other crazy parameters, that's this infinite product. And Han is one of these guys he was a, um, who has been generalizing this, and I like this theorem. So what I asked my REU students to do is ask, are there identities, kind of like what was discovered by Euler and Jacobi, that nobody ever discovered before because they didn't know where to look? So notice, this is a generalization of Nekrasov and Kunkov, if you let y and t be 1. So because there's many more parameters, we have many more infinite products, and maybe there's some beautiful identities that just have never been unearthed. So, for example, if you choose some specializations, you're asking when do sums like this, this is a generalization of what we had before, like when this was z, when do sums like this vanish? And when they do vanish, you get identities like the type that were discovered earlier by these people that lived in a different era. Not quite the era of the dinosaurs, but certainly for many of my undergraduate students, you talk about theorems proved by Euler, Gauss, and Jacobi. Some of them might actually believe that the dinosaurs were alive when these theorems were proved. So can you find them? You can find them all. So here's a cool theorem that was proved by Emily Clater, Yovana Kemper, and Nick Wagge. They prove that the complete set of pairs AB, for which there is a formula for capital A, little a, b, n, namely there is an identity of the type that I'm alluding to, is in this list. Three of them are in red. The ones that are in red were the ones that were discovered by Euler, Gauss, and Jacobi. So what are the ones in black? They're all new. It's awesome to have 19-year-old, 20-year-old kids say, holy crap, in this infinite fam I hope that's not upsetting to anybody. I can't help, but the words that come out of my mouth, I, I can't control all the time. Um, but uh, what you have is, in this infinite family, they were very surprised to discover that there were identities of that type that no one knew to look for because they didn't know where to look. And when it covers the famous three ones that are in all the books, and you get new ones, that's exciting. So I like that in the work of Nekrasov and Kunkov, and we learn a lot of things. These identities of Euler and Jacobi and, and, and Gauss are famous. They've been generalized in many different ways. And who would think in the 21st century it could be generalized in this dramatic a way? It's kind of like this. If you're a theoretical chemist, you, 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 you've discovered that the, that the super heavy elements have a bound, are, 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 well, the bound on the atomic, el atomic numbers of the super heavy elements in the periodic table goes beyond the elements that have actually been constructed on Earth. So there are chemists actually trying to construct elements with atomic number 118, 119, at great cost, getting one new one at a time, with a new lab, lots of expensive machinery. This is like that. 
Except the machinery is free. It comes in the formulas of Hahn and Nekrasov and Akunkov. Are there more super heavy elements, my ana anal analogy being cool identities that you can explain to anyone? Yes. And in fact, instead of just a couple, you get dozens more. How do you prove them? They become combinatorial exercises. You fill up notebooks of partitions, you fill up no notebooks with those numbers, and ask, are there involutions, are there symmetries where these numbers cancel and must be zero? And that's something all talented undergraduates can begin to do. In fact, in a way, it was really tough for them because there are too many of them to do. Right? In a way, it would, on the one hand, it, it, it would have been pleasing to only get three or four more, work less. But it's also pleasing that there's a lot more, meaning more work, but more new results. All right. Great. All right. The last thing I'm going to conclude with is, it's a little bit more highbrow. It's geared mostly towards students who've had um, uh, a class in field theory, come from, from your algebraic number theory class or your algebra class. And it's about number fields. If you ever visit Ohio State, they'll tell you that number fields are these. I'm lying to you. I, don't, I think it's weird, actually. I wouldn't. I have many friends at Ohio State, but I think it's really weird that they have statues of gigantic numbers on campus. Right? It'd be much more. But I mean, Ohio State, they have the Buckeye. What is the Buckeye anyway? Right? You guys, have, I, I know you have a lion, right? What is it? The, no, you have a tiger. I saw the tiger. All right. So you might, yeah. A big state school with a strong football team really should have sculptures of imposing animals. In Ohio State, they have the Buckeye. I still don't know what that is, so they instead put large, gigantic numbers. That's weird. Now, more seriously, a finite dimensional field extension of the rational numbers is called a number field. So I want to end this talk introducing you to a, a theorem by one of my very best friends, Manjul Bhargava, and illustrate how that, and he won the Fields Medal for this too. So every theorem, every topic has a Fields Medal inspiring it. And these are all very recent Fields Medals. So to every number field, there's an invariant you, you learn about. It's called the discriminant. It's a number. And I, I don't have time to go into it, uh, so let me exaggerate quite a bit but to, to say that the discriminant of a number field can be thought of in one of two ways. It can be thought of in terms of analysis, in terms of measuring the volume of what are called the integers in the field. And if you're interested in algebra or Galois theory, the same number controls something called the ramification and the Galois theoretic properties of his extensions. But never mind. For every number field, there's a simple number. Think of it as like measuring the height of a human being. In the case of quadratic fields, Q would join the square root of a number. This discriminant is a simple thing. It's either D itself, or it's 4 times D, depending on whether D is 1 or not mod 4. So for example, you know about I. It's a square root of minus 1. The smallest number field obtained by adjoining i has discriminant minus 4, right? Negative 1 is not 1 mod 4, so you have to multiply by 4. And another field, q join root 2, has discriminant 8. But by this formula, you see there's a very simple correspondence between the numbers that you're taking the square roots of and the discriminants. And to sort of motivate this question, I could ask, how are, the, how are these fields distributed? So you could define n sub 2 of x to be a count, the count of these fields whose discriminants don't grow, aren't bigger than x in absolute value. But that's actually easy if you calculate these numbers, n sub 2 of x, for 100, 10,000, and a million, you get these numbers. If you divide them by x, you get the proportions. These are the proportions of discriminants that are number fields. And it's a theorem by, there's no one named Easy that proved this. It's just easy. If you take the right class, this is just easy. If you've never seen it, it's not hard. If it looks hard, it's actually just easy. And the limit as x goes to infinity of n2 over x is 6 over pi squared. These numbers are converging very rapidly to 6 over pi squared. It's not hard. It's actually, if you've never seen these kinds of calculations before, where powers of pi are related to these sorts of expressions, you have something to look forward to in some of your forthcoming classes. What's hard is, what if you study general number fields? What if you wanted to study numbers that are more complicated than just taking the square root? There's an old conjecture of Linux 
that if you consider number fields of degree n, so adjoining cube roots of unity would be like degree 3 fields, he claimed a similar function, counting them with discriminant up to x, should grow like a multiple of x, where this is a constant depending on the degree. So in this case, that constant would be 6 over pi squared. And we have some conjectures on what the c of n is, um, but you'll see in a moment that we're nowhere near asking anything about that number. What is the state of the art to this day on this problem? The, there's the theorem easy when n is 2. When n is 3, cubic fields, there's very deep work of Davenport and Heilbronn that answers this question. And for quartic and quintic fields, there was the recent work of Manjul Bhargava, and he largely won the Fields Medal for this theorem and a related theorem about elliptic curves. We're not going to criticize this theorem. This is my friend. He's still alive. You could say, what about six? And I'll say, we're not there yet. Great. So you can win a Fields Medal for answering a simple question. Questions are simple, but often hard to answer. So how hard are they? You might know about the name Jordan Ellenberg. He's actually in a film that just came out last week. It's called Gifted. Um, uh, actually, I, I won't go into it, but uh, it's, um, he plays himself, and he's an awkward math professor. Uh, and, and, yeah, it's a great film. I talked about another film yesterday, but let me get back to the theorem. So my friend Jordan and Akshay Venkatesh basically set the world record. N, N of x, which is supposed to grow like a constant times x, they proved is no bigger than these functions. Let's not worry about this for a moment. Let's look at this. If n is like 80,000, n plus 2 over 4 is like 20,000, x to the 20,000 is a whole lot bigger than x. So we're, like not, we're basically not even proving theorems. So Linux conjecture says that n, n of x grows like x, and both of these are nowhere near like x. They're, they're exploding. Great. So I asked my REU students, after Manjul won the Fields Medal, to study a related problem. You see, when we count number fields by degree, we're ignoring the fact that for each degree, there are many different kinds of fields that are allowed to exist. But the many is still a finite number of candidates for each n. So maybe for some small n's, there are some candidates that we are much better at counting which allows us to determine exactly where the hard part of these problems are. So that's what I asked them to do. So it comes from Galois theory. So let's let G be a finite group. And let's count the number of number fields of degree n with discriminant up to x, whose Galois closure has that fixed group G. So for every n, there's only finitely many finite groups of order n. So there are a number of options for each choice of n. And my guess was that for some ends, we, this was a problem we could solve. So it turns out even estimating n sub n gx is only easy when n is 2 and the group is stupid. It's z mod 2 z. It's, it's only easy in this one case. There's a very big theorem by David Wright, PhD at Harvard, and says if p is prime, in the case of the cyclic group, this number is like a constant times x to the 1 divided by p minus 1. That's a theorem. Linux theorem says that the total n of x should grow like a constant times x, so it tells you that these groups are super rare. So they don't contribute to the measure, but at least it's a theorem. And it's an example of how do you pick a group and be in a position where you can actually prove a theorem. So a few years ago, um, I guess 10 years ago now, 12 years ago, depending on when it was done, these French mathematicians, this is the famous Henri Cohen in Bordeaux, conjectured in the special case of three that this theorem should be, well, the main term is true, but they claimed that the error term was much too large in Wright's theorem. The error term is still, error terms, the theorem is still true, but they conjectured something much, much tighter would be true, so, right? X to the one six, there's much smaller numbers than like X to the one third, meaning that these terms are very, are, are, are closer to the expectation um, for large x than what he was able to prove. So here's a cool theorem. My students didn't mess around with 3. They, said they just did it for all p. And in fact, it's even more awesome than p. Instead of getting an error term, they were able to prove some of this is now unconditional, so forget the GRH part. They prove for every prime p, this function is indeed 
a constant times x to the 1 over p minus 1, plus a secondary term, which is x to the 1 over 3 times p minus 1 times a polynomial in the log, plus an error term, which is super, super small. If p is 3, p minus 1 is 2. So that's x to the 1 8. It's much smaller than x to the 1 3rd. Certainly smaller than x to the 1 6. So it offered a better theorem than what Cohen was conjecturing. So there's two terms. This is smaller than this, and it's there. Yeah, so I said this is a long time. So the G, you can get erased. Yeah. So to give you an indication of how good their theorem is, if you take the logarithms and subtract away the first term, if you take the logarithm, this should look like a line. So if you calculate up number fields up to degree 10 to the 25th, which is huge, you can see the linear regression does begin to form like a line. And that's what we're producing here. So if you want to find Galois groups of arbitrary prime degree, of Galois cyclic group, they tell you exactly how many there are. Unfortunately, it's a density zero subset of what we're after if we're trying to prove Linux conjecture. But it's still like a real theorem. Great. So that's what I wanted to talk about. I want to talk about some of the opportunities that are available in research. None of these projects required reading more than two or three papers. If you're wondering, say, as a professor, how much background is literally required to enter these projects, what's this? I usually require about a year of analysis, a year of, uh, of algebra, and a little bit of free time in March and April leading up to the program so people have free time to read papers. And then from day one at 10 AM, first Monday, we're lecturing. And by, well, I'm, I have to say, I'm, maybe I'm a little bit intense about that. but. Um, it's super fun, and we end up proving these theorems. I never pick projects that don't have the prospect of, I think, um, some exciting work related to contemporary things that requires more than two or three papers to read. That's all I wanted to say. All right, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Questions? No. Andre Kumpov's theorem? Yeah. What year was Andre's theorem? I don't remember exactly. It's probably about 2000, maybe 1999. Okay. All of these theorems are within the last 15 to 20 years. And all of them are still sufficiently new that even people who work in the field don't fully appreciate their strength. I think Kumpov's theorem should be much, and, and, and in Andre's case, I think part of it's his fault. He kind of um, doesn't trumpet how awesome that theorem is because he's, his, his emphasis is elsewhere in how he uses it um, and related, related to things like counting plane partitions, which some of you in, the, in Carl's class may be studying. Yes? When you wrote that equation, you said you had to write it. There's also a product on the left. Why do you think the product on the left hand side is less weird than the product on the right hand side? Could you say that again? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but they're all finite products. Here's the point. I know how to manipulate those diagrams so that there's cancellation, inner cancellation of them, so that instead of actually ever manipulating a product, what I'm actually doing is counting what are the special shapes that actually contribute to the series versus those that don't, like the triangular ones, if, right? Yeah, in every one of those cases, there's some very slick involutions. They get more difficult to find, but they, yeah. I like replace, this is actually a theme in some areas of combinatorics, where you have two sets that are in near bijection with each other, but occasionally there's some mismatches. Can you identify the mismatches? We're turning the problem of computing those power series into the combinatorial problem of, of that kind of thing, looking for near bijections. Phil? How did you calculate number fields up to 10 to 25? Oh, how did I calculate number fields up to 10 to 25? I didn't do it. I got Henri Cohen, who's, who's, who, who is one of the co-creators of Paris, yeah. and he's programming all the time. That's his table. He didn't believe our theorem, so he calculated that table. I said, go do it. You're going to see a line. So he, cal yeah, he calculated that. Other questions? 
But the third Porcelli lecture tomorrow is called Can't You Just Feel the Moonshine? I hope you'll all come back to hear that. Let's thank Ken again for today's lecture.